Big T is it? Hello. How are you doing, Zach? Can I call you Zach? Is that okay? Is it Q? Are you there? Hello, hello, sir. Hello. How are you doing? Um, I'm, I'm fine, and you, sir. Um, so can I should I call you Zach? Zach, how do you pronounce your name? I want to make sure I get it right. Yes, this is a Portuguese name, and the. Uh, here, here, some people call me Zakio. Zakio? Yes. Okay. Is that right? Is that Zaku? Yes. Okay. I I want to keep doing it until I get it actually right. So keep keep working we with it because I learn new names all the time because we've got a yes. fairly global program. So that's nice. How are you enjoying the course? For me, I, I I'm really enjoying the course. Uh, I'm learning a lot, and uh, even now I have some doubts to to pre and NIP and NIPCC. Mm -hmm. I was I, I was I was reading some some articles, and the uh, the the community saying that IPCC is is slightly better than NIPCC. Yeah. Because, did you uh, did you watch the class videos? Where we covered the IPCC. Mm -hmm. yeah, Did that, you go I think back and lesson. watch those? Yes, I think it's lesson two, right? Yeah, make sure to watch them because you know one of the things that we stress a lot in here is um, what makes something believable. You know, as a fact, is the science is the process by which you go about doing it, right? And so, you know, if you look at the IPCC. You know, you could worry about somebody's going to present these findings. Are they biased, right? Do they have a certain opinion or an agenda they're trying to get across when they're telling you facts and numbers and statistics? And so you want a process that's going to go at the truth, you know, that has the least amount of bias possible. And so, like, for example, with the IPCC, you have 200 countries. Each one of them nominates somebody, their scientist, to go sit on this panel. And so you have a big collection of scientists, all selected by different countries with different agendas, different biases. <clears throat> and so it's unlikely that all the scientists you would pick would have the same bias, right? Now, with the NIPCC, there's one lead author who selects all the scientists that are going to be on the writing team. So if that person's biased, you could have a huge amount of bias, right? Because you just pick people that think the way you do. But beyond that, so once the writing team's assembled, they're now picking papers from the peer-reviewed literature. Remember, each paper had to be sent to three different authors, you know, three different experts in the field before it was accepted by the journal to begin with. So you've got the scientific review process going there. And so there's a lot of different features of the IPCC that um, are kind of there to remove bias. They go through a review period where after they write everything, they then send it out for peer review to over 200 scientists to read it. And again, it's this large body of folks that pick which scientists will be the reviewers. In the NIPCC, it's that lead author again who gets to pick who reviews it. And with the IPCC, you've got public comments. Anybody can write in. Um, you don't have that with the, with the uh, NIPCC. And then finally, once you get your final assessment with the IPCC, all the countries sit around at a table with their representatives and they go through it line by line and only keep the lines that everybody agrees with. There isn't any kind of review process that goes on with the NIPCC. So you you tend to believe the one that has a more stringent anti-bias kind of uh, science behind it, you know, where they're coming up with their recommendations, because all these people are agreeing. It's not one person influencing really what the message is coming out, you know, and what they agree upon is what they agree upon. You know, there's a lot of arguments to be made that IPCC, you know, could have used bolder um, models in their climate modeling. And some countries didn't like some of those, you know, um, assessments. So they went, you know, with the more moderate um, uh, projections for warming. 
but Let's make see. sure to watch those. And then um, there's that peer review, uh, peer teaching that you're going to do on how you might justify your own. Take a look at that prompt on Flipgrid and try and do your response when you can. Okay, sir. Thanks. Okay. Hello, everybody. Glad you could join us. Um, Hello. How was your weekend? It was good. It was good. And yours? It was good. Got to play with the kids a lot, which is always a good thing. I'm getting, I'm planning a bunch of different trips next week for different conferences. So we're going to, we might have to, I maybe I'll record the video ahead of time um, or we'll make uh, a different time for class or maybe we'll just skip a class. We'll see what we can work out. I got to find out what my flight information is going to be, but I'll keep you all posted and we can work together on that. Um, now I see that a lot of you have done their latest flip, but some of you have not for, um, indicators of climate change. I'm going to start reviewing those. And so if it's not up there, you're not going to get credit for it. Um, and remember that's a, a big part of how we do the grading in this course. So, um, uh, Nyamunga, I think you've got to still do yours and post yours up. And Zach, I'd like you to go ahead as um, as, as um, best you can to go through the previous lectures that you missed and um, go ahead and upload a peer teaching video on there as well. Um, uh, even if you, so I've, Brenda, I've been sending out links to do, um, to do the flips. You don't need to access the Claflin stuff in order to be able to do the flips. So, um, let me go ahead. I'll paste the link in. Um, let me go ahead and do this copy. And I'm going to do this in the chat. Um, I will check with the Claflin folks to make sure um, that uh, you get your password. I see you can't hear what I'm saying. I'll send the link. Uh, and the YouTube link to this video later today so you can hear it. Um, okay, let's go ahead and get started um, with the, we were talking last time about the physics of warming. And so we had a lot of data from the climate record and others that show us that the, that the world is warming. Don't have any indication yet as to why, right? So we have to first understand a little bit of the physics of what warmth is and how energy is transferred to one place to another in, in order to really kind of um, understand what, 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 what follows. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen up here. And what? Share screen. Okay, so. Let's see. When it comes to energy transfer, we're all really familiar with energy transfer, right? You know, like with the toaster, you plug it in. We know that energy is going from uh, the form of electricity from the wall into the toaster. The toaster's heating up and warming your toast, right? You can also put a, 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 pot, of, a pot on the stove, fill it with water, turn on the flame. We know that energy is being transferred um, from the stovetop into the water and hopefully cooking our eggs. Um, so that th those are things we're familiar with. Um, we have to take into account where does the earth get its energy from, its warmth from. And we know that the sun is really the primary um, uh, energy input for the earth. And that's 150 kilometers away. And so we talked about how does that energy get from the sun through the vacuum of space, the void of space, which is mostly empty, um, all the way to the earth. And that's through electromagnetic radiation. We talked about what electromagnetic radiation comprises, that it's visible light, but it's also X-rays, gamma rays, ultraviolet, infrared, there's microwaves and radio waves. The electromagnetic radiation is a spectrum 
And what defines one thing from another is just the wavelength. So we talked a little bit about, you know, when you have a wave, you've got the peak of the wave and the trough of the wave. Um, and the distance from one peak to the next is our wavelength. So this is how long our waves are. Um, and that's what is determining which type of electromagnetic radiation that we've got. So really short wavelengths means high energy, okay? Short wavelength, high frequency, high energy. Um, those are cosmic rays. And you can, as the wavelength gets longer, we get into gamma rays, make them longer. Their X-rays make them even longer. They become ultraviolet rays. And then eventually we'll do our whole visible spectrum. Now here, we're going to use nanometers and micrometers quite often in this course. So you should be interchangeable with that. Um, one nanometer is a thousand uh, micrometers. But our, <clears throat> our visible light range um, is between about 380 to around 700, 750. Um, and then you start getting into the infrared. You can even get longer than that. Microwaves that we use to cook our food, radar that we use to watch planes with, radio, which, you know, you can listen to the radio um, and even broadband. Uh, um, some of those waves for like broadband uh, TV can be actual like a kilometer um, between one peak and one trough, which is pretty amazing. Okay. So that's electromagnetic radiation. We have to think about um, how is that electromagnetic radiation going to be used? So we need to start talking about the energy source and the internal energy. So um, as you, does anybody know what the classical definition of temperature is for, from physics? Okay, we'll get to it then. Um, but basically, you want to think of an, the internal energy of an object. An object is composed of atoms and molecules, right? And the atoms and molecules are always vibrating and moving around a little bit. If you're in a liquid, they can move around quite a lot. If, you're, if they're trapped in a solid, they're kind of stuck in place, but they can still vibrate. The warmer an object gets, the more these things vibrate and move around. If you've got a liquid, the faster those molecules will start zooming around liquid. Same thing with a gas. The more force and um, energetic the molecules will be as you heat it up. So temperature is our measure of internal energy. The hotter the object is, the faster the atoms and the molecules are moving in the object. Um, and the classical or physics definition of temperature is defined as the average kinetic energy of the atoms and or molecules in an object or a gas or a liquid. So temperature is just kinetic energy, the motion of those molecules. Okay. Everybody follow with me so far? Okay. Now, we also talked uh, last time about... Um, uh, different temperature scales. We generally are really familiar with the Fahrenheit and Celsius scales, and I introduced the Kelvin scale, which is just Celsius plus 273. And does anybody remember what the key points were from the Kelvin scale? Two points, basically, about the Kelvin scale, why we use it is one, zero, in the Celsius scale, zero is when water freezes, 100 is when water boils. Um, in the Kelvin scale, zero is what we call absolute zero. And since we're defining temperature as the motion, the average kinetic energy of atoms, absolute zero means they're not moving. Okay, and that's exactly what, what that means. Absolute zero, there's no kinetic energy. There's no movement of these atoms. But as they warm up, they start to move and vibrate faster. Now, this is where black body radiation comes in. Um, 
we know that atoms have these clouds of electrons, right? And these electrons are charged. But when these atoms start to move back and forth, you're getting these electrons starting to move back and forth. And what we know from physics and um, electromagnetism is that whenever you have a charge and you begin moving that charge, that creates an electromagnetic field. Um, that's why if you take a coil of wire and you start passing electricity through it, you attach it to a battery, and the electricity is going through a coil, those moving electrons, those moving charges, will create a magnetic field, and that's how you make an electromagnet. Same thing that's used, those electromagnets that um, pick up cars, you know, at a junkyard, um, those, it's just electricity going through a coil, and because you've got electrons, charged particles uh, moving, they create this electromagnetic field. But when the electromagnetic field collapses, when it like, when it moves out and then comes back in, um, that can generate a photon. And so this is actually happening all of the time. Okay. All, ad all objects are composed of atoms or molecules. All those atoms and molecules, unless you're at absolute zero, which is really, really cold. Um, so all the objects that we deal with, um, they have these motions. And because they're moving, their electric, their electrons are moving, creating little electromagnetic fields, which are generating photons. Um, the higher the temperature, the more the movement, the more the movement, the more um, uh, charge you have generating electromagnetic field, and the more photons you're going to create. Okay. And the remember, we said that lower wavelengths or i'm sorry higher wavelengths are lower in energy and shorter wavelengths are higher in energy so we might expect shorter and shorter wavelengths coming from something that is um hotter and hotter okay <clears throat> so i can't stress this enough that everything around you is emitting photons all of the time so if you look around the room, every single object here is glowing. Okay, it's called black body radiation. Okay, um, now you might be wondering why you can't see it. So we'll kind of go through that a little bit. Um, so we know that everything is emitting black body radiation. The wavelength of that emission is determined by temperature. So would we expect shorter wavelengths or longer wavelengths if something is really, really hot. If something's hot, would we get short wavelengths or long wavelengths? Shorter wavelengths. Shorter wavelengths because it's higher energy. So there's actually um, uh, uh, what we call Wien's displacement law which tells you the peak wavelength, that's, we'll go with the symbol lambda here, is equal to 2897 divided by the temperature. And that will give you that peak wavelength. It'll give it to you in microns, but your temperature has to be in Kelvin. You can't use Celsius or you'll get the wrong answers, okay? And so we're gonna add this on to our list of equations. And we're going to keep a running list of all the different equations that we use. But it's important, and I'll show you why. So, for example, if this is our equation, write that down in your notes. 2897 divided by T. And this is going to calculate our peak wavelength in microns, provided our temperature is in Kelvin. So, um, what would a room temperature object radiate at? What wavelength would it radiate at? Remember now, you've got to take room temperature and um, you're going to use this formula, right? You're going to have to, uh, room temperature, let's say is around 22 degrees Celsius, any use between 20 or 22. And so we're first going to have to convert 
our room temperature in Celsius to Kelvin. So that gets us to 295 Kelvin. So it's, it's simply 2897 divided by 295 or 9.82. So that gives us 9.82 microns. Or if we wanted that nanometers, 9,820. So remember, uh, um, yeah. Okay. So um, what I'm gonna show you here is an actual emission spectra for um, that kind of an object. Actually, this one's at 300 uh, Kelvin. Um, what this is showing you is the um, output of one of these black bodies and the um, wavelengths of the photons that are being emitted from it, okay? Tells us how much power is rating from an object at each wavelength. So if you were to look at 15 um, micron wavelengths, that would mean you've got um, a power of around 20 units here. Don't worry about the units, but um, if we were looking at, uh, um, now we had calculated about 9.8 microns. So if you look at 9.8 microns, now we've got about uh, 30 units. That Wien's law that we use to calculate the 9.8, what that's giving you is the peak wavelength but there's a lot of other wavelengths around as well. And so that's something that's really important to remember is that Wien's law just gives you the peak wavelength, um, but the black body will actually emit a range of wavelengths. Now, over in this gray part over here, that's actually the visible light range, okay? Visible light range nanometers is between 400 and 700. Um, actually, it's about 380 to almost 800, depending on the very edge of the... In microns, it would be 0 0.4, 0 0.3, all the way to 0 0.7 or 0 0.8. Okay. And so what we had calculated here, remember, was 9.8 microns. Right. And so where does that fall on this? Um, that would be way out in this direction. So that's going to fall into somewhere between, somewhere in this box here called the infrared. Okay. Because that goes up to a thousand microns. That's pretty, pretty far, right? So that means that humans can't see room temperature objects glowing, but they are glowing all over the place. Now, there are times when you can see um, black body radiation, and that's if you heat it up some more. So you're probably all familiar with an oven filament, right? You go to cook something in the oven, turn it on, starts to warm up, it gets to the point where it's glowing hot, okay? Um, now, let's assume that we're getting up to 1750 in Kelvin, okay, that these things are heating about 1750 in Kelvin, um, and 1750 in Kelvin would be around 1477 Celsius, okay? So really hot. What is the peak wavelength? that one would expect from this kind of black body object. So on your little sheet of paper, go ahead and go back to our Wien's law, 2897 divided by temperature. You need your temperature in Kelvin. And now we're talking 1750. So well, what kind of value are you getting? Uh, 1.43 in peak wavelength. Okay, and what would the units be? 
Oh, migraines. <laughs> right. Okay. Migraines. Okay. So what I got here, 2897 divided by 1750 is 1. 1.7 microns. So this peak still isn't in the visible light range. Remember, our visible light range is from about 0.38 to about 0.8 maximum. Okay. But here's, here's the uh, uh, spectrum for this object, for an object at uh, 1750 Kelvin. And um, here's our peak wavelength, right, for um, about 1.7. And the visible range is, I put that in this dotted line here. Okay. So a majority of this, you can see, where it's emitting most of the photons, we can't even see those. We're just seeing, here's the visible light spectrum. I'm gonna expand that. So this is the part that we see. Almost no blue or green in here. It's mostly of this little part, only the red and the orange. And that's why what we see here is mostly red and orange. but it's emitting way more photons than what you're seeing here. What's happening to the photons? Where are they going? All the um, photons that you don't see, where are they going? Um, they're releasing, they're being released from the actual filament as heat. Maybe. Well, they're being released from the actual filament as photons, as electromagnetic radiation. And then they're slamming into whatever you put in the oven. So if you're cooking a steak, those photons are slamming into that steak. And so you've got all this energy in the form of photons slamming into that steak. What do you think is going to happen to the steak? Well, it's the reverse of the process, right? Now you've got these photons coming in. You've got um, you know, an object that's got atoms and molecules that are vibrating. But now you've got these photons coming in with all this energy, knocking them around. It's going to make them vibrate and move faster. That's our definition of temperature. The faster these things move, the more kinetic energy they have, the higher the temperature is. So there's a direct correlation between um, the temperature, kinetic energy, and the block the black body radiation or absorption. So that's how you cook food is you're just um, making these atoms move really, 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 really fast. So they their electrons start moving and that starts photons um, streaming out of them. And then those photons can slam into other things and heat those things up. And it's really important to know the wavelength range that thing, these things submit in. You know, normally you might not care, like that might not be a really a salient detail for whatever you're gonna cover in a class. But for climate change, this is incredibly important. What wavelengths things emit at and um, uh, especially black bodies. But, you know, try and remember there's always gonna be this direct correlation between the temperature um, of a, a of an object and then the amount of radiation that it's going to release at its peak wavelength. And we can make detectors for this, right? So we should be able to measure temperature just by looking at infrared light. And that's exactly, um, you know, you've probably seen these little you know, ear thermometers, sometimes they have them for, um, or you just do it on somebody's forehead. These became really a lot more prevalent during uh, COVID. But what they're doing is um, the uh, baby's eardrum in this case, or the person's eardrum is at a certain temperature. And because it's at a certain temperature, its molecules are vibrating, which means its electrons are moving around which means it's generating those electromagnetic fields, 
which means it's emitting photons. And we've seen um, for at least a room temperature object that it's going to emit in the infrared. Um, and so you can tell just how much what your temperature is um, by the infrared light. Now, here's a, here's a picture of a dog taken with an infrared camera, okay? Um, what should be the peak, what should be the peak temperature uh, or the peak radiation for say um, a human or a dog? What's our characteristic wavelength? Let's work through that. First off, what temperature is a normal human body at? Dogs are at about the same. Caldrian, you're um, on silent. You're on mute. Uh, um, uh, 92 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, usually it's, you'd be a little 97. bit dead on that one. You'd be probably for 97. Fahrenheit. It's 98.6, um, is what you should have if you're in Fahrenheit, if you're a human, um, you know, you can get a temperature, you might be at 99, a hundred, if you go past 103, that's, you should go to the hospital. When you start going lower below um, 98.6, you know, you can start experiencing hypothermia. 97, 96 degrees, I don't think you'd want to go to 92. I think by 92, that means you're probably dead already. Um, in Celsius, it's about 37. So body temperature in Celsius should be 37. So please, if everybody can, calculate um, the... Uh, characteristic wavelength that a human should glow at. These back the way they were. So 9.3 microns. Body temp equals 37. Does everybody does everybody getting that? This should yes. be about 310 Kelvin. So 2897 divided by 310. What was the value? How many microns? 9.3 microns. 9.3 microns. Is this in the visible range? No. No. No, but this should be the peak where you see the peak temperature um, or, or the peak wavelength should be around there. And so when we go back to our dog picture that I've got here, this is taken with an infrared camera. And so it actually has a color scale, right? Um, and <clears throat> so when it's up here really bright, this is about 37. Uh, well, all the way down here is around 23. And, you know, dogs have around the same temperature humans do. And so, um, you know, our peak temperature is around here. And so the eyes are lighting up because that's, the eyes are probably closest to the body temperature because you can see through the skull, et cetera. You can see it's cooler along the fur because of that insulation there. Humans look the same with this, right? So we're all glowing all of the time and emitting these photons. Um, if you think of the incandescent light bulb, okay? An incandescent light bulb works um, uh, because of the presence of a filament, usually a tungsten filament. And what you do is you run electricity through that filament and that starts to make that filament really, really, really hot. Okay, there's a lot of resistance, um, the electrons pouring through, so it creates a lot of heat. That tungsten filament 
gets super, super hot, and you end up uh, getting an emission curve that looks like this. Notice that our peak wavelength is um, around one micron. So our peak wavelength, we still can't even see as humans, since we only see in the visible light, we can't even see how bright it really, really is because most of the light is coming off in the infrared. In fact, if you were to add up, you know, all of these photons that are under the curve, um, the photons that you can't see and compare that to the number of photons that you can see, you can see there's a great amount, many times the amount of photons that you're just not aware of that you can't see in the visible range. And that's what makes these incandescent light bulbs terribly, terribly inefficient as um, just think of how much energy is going um, used in this light bulb to make this um, emission spectrum. And most of the emissions are not anywhere in the useful part. And so all this energy is going to the non-useful part of emissions um, that we can't see. Um, but certainly incandescent light bulbs like tungsten filament light bulbs can get really, really hot. And if you touch it, you know, after it's been on for a while, you'll notice that, right? And so uh, I wanna share with you just a couple different emission spectrum for different temperatures and kind of show you where the visible light range is. So here's our room temperature object at around 300 Kelvin. You can see it's got a characteristic, I think we calculated that about 9.8, um, but all those photons we're just not seeing. And so things may be shining as bright as a light bulb all these objects around us are shining as bright as a light bulb in the infrared. We just can't see it. Now, if you go up to about 1600, now this is getting close to our oven temperature, maybe a little bit uh, warmer than our oven temperature, you can see that a tiny little speck of, um, of the curve falls in the visible light range and really that's just gonna be the red and the orange. You don't really get much of the blue, which is why when you look at that filament, it's orange, red, these things, that's where the phrase red hot gets from, comes from, because anything can get red hot. You heat it up enough, eventually it's black body, or black body radiation spectrum will start to get to higher, um, to shorter and shorter wavelengths and eventually a probe in the visible spectrum. Anybody know how hot the sun is on the surface of the sun? So if you've got Google next to you, why don't you type in how hot is the surface of the sun? It says 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Right, and what's that in Celsius? It should say right next to it. Comes to about 5,600 5, Celsius. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So here I've got the curve on for a black body radiator at around 6,000 um, uh, Kelvin, right? So remember, you have to add 273 on your Celsius. So that would be 5,800. So pretty close to 6,000. Take a look at our emissions uh, spectrum. It peaks in the visible light. Can you see sunlight? Does sunlight emit in all the different frequencies? We know that it does, you know, when it rains and you 
and the light hits a raindrop and spreads out in the sky as a as a uh, a rainbow, you can see all the colors in the spectrum separated out, right? And so we know sunlight has all the visible light um, wavelengths. That's because it's a black body radiator at around 6,000 degrees Kelvin. And we talked last time about why we see in the particular range that we do. And that's because our atmosphere, and we'll go into this um, in a lecture or two, it's because our atmosphere is fairly invisible to uh, visible light. In other words, visible light passes right through oxygen and nitrogen and argon without, uh, uh, without a problem. And so we can see fairly easy. Any questions about black body radiation? It's really vital that you know this and that you can make your calculations um, uh, with Wien's law to know what our characteristic temperature is and that you understand that although objects may um, may not look like they're radiating around us, they certainly are glowing constantly, giving off energy. So everybody is on board. We got all this part, this part, I can move on to the next. Okay. Um, so what happens, um, so if, if all these things are emitting around us, they're emitting energy, right? What would you expect if an object is releasing its energy, what would you expect to happen to the temperature of the object? If it, it's similar, so it's a decrease? You'd expect yeah. it to decrease, right? Um, so if I have this soda bottle, okay, I'm going to go ahead and turn this up. Um, so if I have this soda bottle right now, it's at room temperature, and I set it down, and I leave it, come back in an hour. Now, we've just learned that at room temperature, it's radiating lots of energy in the form of infrared light. So one would expect since it's giving off energy that the temperature of this thing would go down. Why doesn't it go down? I could leave this here for two days, three days, a week. It'll come back and it'll still be room temperature. If it's losing energy, why isn't getting it colder? Why isn't it getting colder? I think uh, heat energy is emitted as long as there is a, a, a difference in um, in temperatures between the object and the, the surroundings. So if the temperature is the same, basically there is no heat energy or because the, the, the heat gradient is, is no longer there. Temperature can only be transferred if there is a gradient. Um, you're thinking of a macro effect, you're correct. You're thinking of a macro effect, but it's not as though because there's no temperature difference between this and the rest of the room that it stops emitting black body radiation. It's still emitting regardless of what the temperature is in the room. So it's still giving off energy and it will continue to give off energy. So, but you're you're on the right track because you mentioned net, so that must mean something else. If this is constantly giving off energy, then what must be happening for it to remain the same temperature? It would be up taking energy. It would have to be taking energy in, right? right? Where is that energy coming from? It would be heated. Where's so, that heat energy coming heat from? From the thermal energy. From where? So, I just set so, it on my desk. Uh, I don't heating. see any energy going into it. 
<laughs> I don't see any energy going into it. Where's the energy going into it coming from? Could you rephrase the question one more time? I, okay. I, 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 so I, I got this object, right? Yes. Um, we know from Wien's law and from black body radiation that it has to be emitting infrared radiation or emitting radiation. We've calculated from Wien's law that it's mostly infrared. Okay. So it's emitting radiation. It's giving off energy. So that yes. means we would expect it to lose energy and cool down. Right. Yes. But it's not. I come back in a week. It's still there. What is happening to allow it to stay the same temperature if it's constantly emitting energy? Maybe and the I, energy is being reflected back to it, so it retains the energy. Energy is coming back into it. Just uh, right, that thermal energy. It's coming from the walls. Remember the walls around the room. They're at room temperature too, so they're emitting black body radiation. We can't see it because it's in the infrared. But so all that energy is hitting this and warming it back up. And it's reaching this thermal equilibrium because the energy going out, that it's radiating out, is equal to the energy coming into it from its surroundings. Make sense? So imagine uh, I take a turkey out of the freezer, right? I want to make a turkey today. Bring the turkey out, it's probably at four degrees Celsius. I set it down on a um, bench top and we could calculate, you know, what its, absor uh, what its radiative spectrum is, right? It'll still be in the infrared because it's cold, so we can't see it glowing. But we know that it's glowing at a certain rate, but since its temperature is lower, it's not outputting the same thing as other room temperature objects. Right. So it has, say, an output or say, say this object, I'm just going to use random numbers here. Say this output was putting out uh, 20 watts in um, radiative energy, black body radiation at room temperature. Right. And if it stays, if it had to stay the same at room temperature, that means it also had 20 watts coming in from the surrounding room temperature room. Now our, now our turkey that we've taken out, it's only radiating five watts because it's colder, okay? But impending into it from the surrounding room on that infrared is still 10 watts. So now you have more energy going into it than you have coming out of it. So what would you expect to happen with its temperature if you just let it sit in the room? more energy in than energy going out. So it's taking on more energy. Its temperature would... It would increase. Would increase, right? That's why things warm up when you take them out of the freezer. But bear in mind the reason why they're doing it, it's mostly the infrared light. They're black body radiation of all the objects around. I mean, there's some that's the imparted like you know, you, when you have room temperature oxygen, those gas molecules are moving at a certain rate. And so when they hit things, you know, if it's hotter gas, they hit them harder. But um, air is a really poor conductor of temperature. You know, gases don't really impart all that much. It's this black body radiation that we're just bathed in. Everything's glowing in. That's heating up our little turkey out of the freezer. But this is the concept that I'm trying to get in, is that for the temperature to stay the same, we always know that the black body is radiating, for the temperature to stay the same, the energy out has to equal the energy going in. There has to be what we call energy balance. Energy in has to equal energy out. And then everything stays the same, right? Temperature stays the same. Now, when we get into global warming and we see the temperature rising, that's going to tell us somehow there's an imbalance 
that the energy out no longer equals the energy in, right? Because if something's warming up, that means it's taking in more energy than it's releasing. And so that's where all this black body stuff is going. That's where all the infrared is going. That's where all the calculating watts of energy transfer. It's just to allow us to have a language to talk about the energy coming into the planet and the energy going out of the planet. And when we can understand that, because we know, you know, we're floating in space and we're getting all this energy from the sun that's probably not changing. And so if we're heating up, why is that the case? It must, must have something to do with their energy output, but we'll talk about that more next time. Thank you everybody for your time and attention. Um, and uh, please read along in the chapters if you can. It's, uh, uh, I thought I picked a book that's uh, pretty well written, so please follow along if you can. And if you have any questions, please reach out to me. I'll set up a one-on-one -on -one Zoom and kind of explain, you know, and chat with you about whatever it is that you're not, uh, uh, that you're, you feel a little bit soft on. Thank you okay, so thank, thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you.